Welcome. Uh, thanks for joining this moderated conversation about science and its role in climate change related litigation. My name is Chris Paduska. I'm a professor in the Department of Physics and Physical Oceanography at Memorial University, which is located in Newfoundland and Labrador, Canada. Uh, I've been working with the American Association for the Advancement of Science in their on-call scientist project, which is part of their scientific responsibility, human rights and law program. My work is focused on how science can help international human rights advocacy groups find success in the emerging area of climate change related litigation. So to place today's discussion in context, there's a part of the legal international field that's really pushing boundaries related to climate change impact litigation. Now science context experts can help build strong legal arguments. However, because these kinds of legal cases are very new, there are many hurdles. And that means it can be challenging to find effective ways to incorporate science data. So this means that an open dialogue is very important between science contact experts and those working to build legal cases. So to help encourage a culture of open dialogue between AAAS on-call scientists and their partners, today's discussion is really designed to showcase people who have an interest in climate change related litigation and who come at this issue from different perspectives and from different regions of the world. So we have Julia Solana, who is an international lawyer at the Center for Climate Crime Analysis and is leading their efforts on methane. We have Aza Tosikan, who is a founder and director of Breathe Mongolia, which is a grassroots nonprofit organization that's registered in the US and Mongolia. And we have Sarah Green, who is a professor of chemistry at Michigan Tech University with expertise in environmental chemistry and science policy. So thanks to each of you for joining us. And to get started, could you tell us about your background and your interests and experience with climate change related litigation? Um, Julia, I'll start with you. Hi, uh, my name is Julia and I'm a Spanish, a Spanish trained lawyer with the Center for Climate Crime Analysis. I've been working with them for about three years now. And my experience varies um, a lot throughout different topics. So I've dealt with cases of environmental uh, pollution and human impact from a polymetallic mine to uh, pollution from coal-fired power plants. And more recently, I've been leading their efforts uh, on tackling methane emissions. Um, in my experience, I would say that it is important to have an ongoing dialogue with the, with the scientists. And the reason is that it, it's not only a matter of evidence of having sort of a, a good number or a good piece of information that we can use in our cases, but it's also about identifying and shaping the legal arguments. Um, one of the things that I encountered fairly, on in, fairly early in my research on methane was that there were some aspects about the science that, is a, that concerns methane that would actually shape some of the legal arguments that, uh, that we could use or that might allow us to um, overcome some of the legal hurdles that we may have when we try to bring methane into um, certain regulations. An example that comes to mind is uh, the fact that um, methane last, has a short, uh, a short life in the atmosphere in comparison, for example, to uh, carbon dioxide. That is something that as a lawyer doesn't necessarily say anything to me or I definitely did not know about it before I, uh, before I got um, into reading more into the topic. And the other point, for example, is that it has a, a lot uh, higher warming impact when you look at the short term because of this um, short life atmospheric uh, um, um, lifespan. Um, so these, for example, are two points that are sort of more scientific in nature, but that can help us bring the effects of methane into an environmental impact assessment. For example, because it may allow us to argue that this impact should be encompassed in that environmental impact assessment because the time where uh, the gas will have its effects falls in the same, um, it's very, com it's comparable or will, or those effects will happen during the uh, lifespan of the project itself. One of the hurdles that we encounter often when we look at environmental impact assessments and climate change is that the regulators often feel like climate change is a long-term issue. It's a sort of like permanent thing that will happen. And that is like 
outside the time frame of what the environmental impact assessment is supposed to do. However, if we can argue that the effects of methane will happen within the lifespan of the project, like that may allow us to bring an argument um, that the methane emissions should be considered there. This is not to say that, you know, oh, we've like solved everything and like this is how you get climate impact uh, into the environmental impact assessment when there is no um, specific provision into it. But I just wanted to sort of showcase how like an, a legal argument might be based on a uh, on a piece of information that may be more scientific in nature and it's not necessarily a number it's not necessarily about how much emission how like what are the emissions like how um are the estimates correctly uh, uh or adequately calculated or things like that but it may just be something as simple as it can shape the way you make your argument um, so yeah, I, I think it's important both for lawyers and for scientists to know that it's not only about having a, a good number or a good study to like prove a specific point, but also that science can be used more broadly to shape your legal arguments or to identify legal arguments that you might be able to use. Thank you. Uh, Sarah, next. Hello. So I am professor of chemistry and currently serving as chair at Michigan Tech University. Uh, my background is actually marine chemistry and environmental chemistry. And I came to climate fairly early when I recognized that if you go far further upstream to look at the original sources of uh, environmental problems, you eventually got to the climate and without fixing that, just about everything else is difficult. So, um, I've been involved with climate communication and educating on climate for quite some time. I served as a science advisor, as a, as a um, Jefferson Science Fellow in the State Department in 2013, 2014, and subsequently at the UN under UNEP, UN Environmental Programs as a science advisor for the GEO-6 report, which came out in 2019. I've also served as, um, an editor for a risk assessment report for the state of Michigan on the line five pipeline, which crosses the Mackinac Straits in Lake Michigan. And since 2015, I've been teaching a course in climate science and policy, which is an interdisciplinary course. We try to bring students from across campus and disciplines from engineering to humanities to social sciences. And for the COP, 26 and COP27, we actually brought delegations of students to COP in, uh, as part of the YAY program, which is the uh, Youth Environmental Alliance for higher in higher education. Um, so we've been wrestling and trying to teach students um, YAY, YAY crosses Michigan Tech and um, Colorado State University and several others, Vanderbilt and Boston University. And we've been working on getting students to understand the intersections between climate um, science and climate policy and how to communicate those things with each other through these interdisciplinary teams. Thanks very much. Uh, Aza. Hello, everyone. My name is Aza Tsukhtahang. I'm from Mongolia. I'm the founder and director of Breathe Mongolia Clean Air Coalition. It's a grassroots nonprofit registered in the US and in Mongolia. Our mission is to eradicate air pollution uh, in Mongolia you, uh, by creating resources to arm people uh, to fight air pollution. And we've been working in three main areas in, um, in terms of fighting air pollution, educating the public, um, holding decision makers accountable through watchdog activities and also by um, promoting collaboration and synergy among different stakeholders. And as you all know, air pollution and climate change are two sides of the same coin. And even though Mongolia contributes less than 0.1% of greenhouse um, gas emissions globally, um, we are impacted by it quite a bit. Our temperature rise um, is uh, like 2.2 <laughs> degrees Celsius. It's almost three times the global um, average warming rate. And uh, the country of Mongolia is very much uh, desertified. Like 
77% of our 120 million hectares of our total territory is affected by desertification and lakes and rivers are just drying up uh, left and right and the glaci glaciers are melting. So it's, it's affecting the entire country's um, ecosystem, the livelihood of, of our people, um, increasing urban migration, and with our very much uh, high dependency on fossil fuel for energy, um, our urban centers are uh, polluted. The, we rank number four on air pollution uh, uh, when compared to other countries in the world as of 2022. And, um, Consequently, you know, we rank very uh, our um, top three killers uh, of our population is uh, related to air pollution, like lung cancer, heart disease, and stroke, and all that. So, I my family is affected by it directly, and my people of only three million people are affected by it on a daily basis. So, even though I work at IBM as a financial analyst and have come from a business management uh, background, uh, I have to take action as a citizen of my country and also a global citizen to, you know, to do my part, to fight air pollution, to uh, in, in fighting air pollution, <laughs> I have to fight climate change as well. So I have a steep learning curve to understand the science, the policy, the um, and all different sectors that contribute to this because there are so many moving parts. So compared to the other speakers, uh, I'm very new to science and legal context, but uh, I have the passion and the will willingness to learn and um, build bridges among stakeholders so we can create synergy to tackle these serious problems. Excellent, thanks very much. So with those introductions, I, you know, I can see that each of you has very different windows into this very complex challenge of climate change related litigation. So first, I'd like to hear about some of the challenges that each of you has encountered while working with science in a legal context, or even in trying to identify science that can help your case. Um, so uh, I'll start back with, uh, with Julia. Yeah, I, I can really relate um, to as a struggle to understand all the different elements uh, of all of this. Because um, I've been working on this a little bit longer than you perhaps, but not that much longer. So I, I still very much feel this steep learning curve uh, every day. I think that um, identifying the science is definitely one, uh, one of the points that, it, that is a challenge because when you don't have a scientific background, your understanding of what's going on is extremely basic. Like there are so many pieces that would be obvious to anyone with a scientific background, even if it's not within their expertise, that just pass you. Like you just have no idea about it. The other, the other point is that um, even what's possible in terms of like detection, what evidence might be available, what might you, what what type of information might you be able to collect. Um, this is also something where you really need to like have an open dialogue with uh, with scientists and have someone to consult on the different topics because you just don't know what's possible until you speak to people that um, that know the topic. Sometimes it may start with someone that is not an expert in the specific thing that you're looking at, but they may just give you pointers that you can then like pull on that thread to like keep coming to um, methods and expertise uh, that is more more relevant to what it is that you're that you're doing um, specifically. That's definitely been uh, my experience in the different areas because looking at pollution from a mine is completely different to looking at uh, you know something like pollution from uh, coal fire power plants and it's completely different to looking at methane. Like they're all very different. So with every new case or new area that I that I start studying, I just find myself sort of like not back at square one, but like you know it's kind of like two steps forward, one step back um, situation. A challenge that I think it's uh, important to, to bear in mind is around communication and context. And I wanted to share a, a small experience that I had in like one of the, the cases that I worked on. We have shown with fairly strong evidence that uh, 
the project that we were looking at was causing pollution uh, in the surrounding area of the project. And we were trying to link that to damage to the population that was living in that area. And after we did the studies and we had the initial conclusions that were like really favorable and we were really happy that we you know, had a strong case to, to drive home, when the coastal analysis um, came came back, like when they looked at statistically what is the correlation between this, you know, the results that we're seeing and the factors that we had identified, the number was just really low, like extremely low. Um, something that you would just not think it's relevant uh, as a sort of at face value, you would just be like, this is ridiculous that you're trying to say that this is the, the cause of this problem. So I think it's important for, for scientists, especially to understand that um, when a number or a piece of information looks uh, irrelevant or too little, but it isn't, you'd really need to help us like build the context, you know, help the judge understand why this number is relevant, why they should listen to this number and take it seriously and give it weight when, when they're evaluating that evidence. Because there's a difference between the way like a scientist would perhaps look at information and, and, a, and a court might, and is that, for a scientist, it's all about like the rigor and the methodology and like, did I do sort of everything the way I should? And these are the results, but the judge is not gonna look at that. That provides rigor to the, to the quality of the information. It speaks to the quality of the information and whether the information is reliable, but it's not going to convince the judge on its own. The judge relies a lot on like, what is the corroborating evidence that I have around me? Like what, what are other sources uh, telling me? What's my lived experience? What is what is common sense? So if a number, if a result of a study seems to go counter common sense, you really need to work hard to, to explain to the judge why that number is relevant and is not against common sense, even though it may look like it. So I think it's very important for scientists to help lawyers have, give con and for lawyers to help scientists frame the information in a way that is persuasive. Um, so that you can communicate, for example, that like because of the type of study that you did, you're just not going to get uh, a higher number than you did, because this is, for example, like a real life situation versus an experiment that is taking place in a lab. There's so many variables So the fact that you found this level of correlation is already significant. Like this is very important. Uh, you need to help us like bring the judge in that in that journey of also understanding like what is the relevance of that science, because a defense lawyer is going to pick that number and it's just going to be like, this is rubbish. They're really trying to pin this on the company on like such a low percentage of correlation. Like that is just, it doesn't pass the test. Um, whereas we, there may be something that we can do uh, to convince the judge that he should listen to this piece of information and that it should, like, that it should consider that it's reliable and that it should give it weight. But in order to, to help the judge give you know, what is the amount of weight, let's say that he has to, or, or she has to give to that information, you need to help them along the way. It's not, uh, it's not someone that is just going to like understand your methodology or like, you know, understand that this is relevant just like, because they don't have all the background that you have. So, so you really need to, to help that process along the way. So there's a lot of challenges, Sarah, from the science perspective. The science perspective. Well, so when Chris first asked me about participating in this webinar, the very first thing that came to mind was a conversation that I had with Yulia actually trying to wrestle with some of her methane questions, which I still have not answered yet, but I, I will. Um, and the question that came up in that call with people from the law side was, why are scientists always estimating things? Why don't they measure them? They're always talking about estimates. And it was something I had never thought about, but and I realized that when the general public and maybe lawyers too think about estimates or thinking about you know eyeballing, well, how much does this thing weigh? Is it two kilos or 10? Um, and the way that word is used in science is, well, we measured methane at this place at this time and we're using the, those grounded data numbers to estimate um, how much comes out of it over the course of a year or how much comes out from the whole region or where, you know, over. So it's an estimate, but the word is used very differently in science. And I then looked in some of my papers in 
various on various topics. And I found that we as the scientists are estimating things all the time and always using that term. <laughs> and the lawyers were like, why don't you just measure it? Um, because the, the terminology was not quite as clear. Um, so I would say one of the key things to do is to think about how, I suppose Yulia would say the judge, but I don't know how judges think. So I have to think like, how would the public, you know, how would your, your great uncle interpret that word that you're using? And sometimes you're using it so commonly that you don't, you don't think there's another, another interpretation. And certainly in climate, that's come up with the ideas of modeling and the terms uncertainties that have to be really carefully defined to differentiate how scientists use them from how they're being used in other contexts. So. Thanks. And Aza, you have to try to link <laughs> the legal and the scientific. So what has been your experience so far? Well, apart from diving deep into understanding the legal context and all the existing regulations and the promises and the legal documents that the government and decision makers create, um, we need to understand the scientific part as well. So for me personally, I had to take climate reality uh, leadership um, training courses or take some um, classes from uh, public health schools in Switzerland. So, uh, and also, you know, recruit people into our team who have the legal background and the scientific background. Um, I'll just give you one example. Uh, Mongolia promised to reduce their greenhouse emissions by 22%, and recently they increased it to 27% by 2030. And they said that 6.2% um, of the greenhouse emissions are coming from the transport sector. And recently in March, the government said that they will reduce the greenhouse emissions of uh, transport sector vehicles by 35%. Um, I don't know what that means uh, specifically. And they said that they came up with a taxonomy to calculate uh, the vehicle emissions of greenhouse gases. Um, I haven't found that document yet. I have to get hold of it. And then I have to understand how they calculated it so that we can hold them accountable you know, what's their specific action plan? How are they going to measure their implementations and different interventions? And how are they going to report it? Um, the challenge we have in Mongolia is that we make our decision makers make all these fancy promises like, okay, we'll decrease pollution by 50% by this, we'll decrease greenhouse emission by this percent by this time. Um, but when they report on it, we don't have we don't have easy access to the raw data. We don't have easy access to the methodology used. And if we don't have easy access to the data, we cannot validate those conclusions or we cannot monitor the progress independently um, to really make sure that we made real progress and it's tangible and it's validated validatable. <laughs> and another example was that um, the government, in 2018, the government said that they reduced their pollution by 50%. And there was no data to back it up. And we, when we dug deep into it, in collaboration with investigative journalists, we found out that the regulation document uh, that specifies the, that uh, that specifies how to calculate the air quality index uh, changed. So the way we calculate the air quality index, because it's changed you know, uh, from like using uh, hourly averages to three hour averages, the pollution level went down and they were just reporting on the air quality index, not the actual raw data. So that's another challenge, access to open, um, you know, independent data and also access to all the different documentations and methodologies used to, you know, back up uh, their promises and to monitor different interventions. And where we don't, as far as I know, for example, we don't know, uh, we don't have a standard 
where um, how much greenhouse emission is acceptable um, or you know what's the limit or what's the emission standard is is for it from the different transportations like diesel diesel fuel transportation. So we only have standards on air pollutants. So how are we going to keep them accountable uh, if we don't have a legal document that lays out, okay, this is the limit, you can't exceed this for greenhouse emissions, and how are we exactly going to monitor those different actions? Can I just- Julia, jump up? please jump in. Um, I feel compelled by uh, Sarah's comment, but uh, I can, again, just really empathize with uh, Asa's experience because um, like that is precisely one of the issues, right? Like one of the issues with the estimates that we were asking Sarah, but like, why are they not measuring? What is this whole estimate thing? Is it because they were comparing different methodologies for estimating, but at the end we were like, well, but it's all estimates. So what, what is the difference? Why should we listen to one over another? Um, but you always have to get deep into like, how did these estimates get compiled? What is the raw data as a, as a, uh, was explaining? Because in the case of methane, for example, like the International Energy Agency recently released their own estimate of emissions. And they said that the energy sector was underreporting by 70%. Like this is not like a matter of like, there's a little bit more, or a little bit extra. It's about getting the whole ballpark wrong. Um, this is why we were, when we were talking to Sarah, we were like, but like, what are these estimates and why are we not just uh, measuring? So it also really helped us to understand uh, when that term was being used, what it meant, you know, when it had a sort of different surname or like second part to the estimate attached to it. So that was also very helpful. But um, with regards to the um, to the methodology and the raw and the raw data, um, what Asa is explaining is uh, is absolutely crucial because. The, if the government changes the methodology or if they input um, the, the pieces of information that they're inputting in the models are wrong or are not what they should, then the whole model is, is gonna be wrong. And that's again, something that we're seeing um, uh, constantly in, in our work. So yeah, I, it's really important to have both the legal expertise and the scientific expertise to know what are the bits of the model or of the information that you're getting that you should be interrogating and, and on what basis can you interrogate it. And again, both factually from a scientific point of view, but also from a, from a legal perspective. I will add to the, um, to the point on the air quality in particular that um, another thing that is, uh, that is often interrogated is where are these um, monitoring stations located because sometimes the authorities don't place them in the place where you know where they should in the sense of like where they're going to get the highest readings but they're just conveniently placed where they're going to get lower readings so that then they can look as if they've lowered the um the emissions or the pollution is less etc so uh having this independent interrogation of the data that uh, as i was talking about is really important Excellent, thanks. Uh, Sarah, uh, also, would you like to chime in on this? Um, yeah, well, data is really hard. I, I think one thing that, that Aza and Yulia do that maybe scientists are less able to do or less have less training to do is, is really that close reading of those government documents. That's something I work on with my students in the climate policy class is that, you know, we see these, these vast, government tomes on this and that. <clears throat> and um, all those words really mean something. <laughs> and so it's, it's important to learn how to read them and to, to digest them and to pull out those, those crucial points, like how was it measured? Where was it measured? Who, who measured it? Who, who decided that this was the right thing to measure or the right place to measure it? Um, and so I think that, that doing that, that kind of work is really a, a key place where science and policy and legal people can can collaborate, um, just because they they have the ability to to get and digest those those data and ask some of the good questions <clears throat> and the policy. Um, and I guess scientists can help by um, doing independent measurements and helping to interpret those independent measurements and helping to interpret which ones are in fact independent. <laughs> asking those asking those questions um, 
<clears throat> but I think I think many scientists are looking for ways to help, and so it it really helps to have people bring out those questions for us that we can we can work on. Yeah. So this leads into another way. I guess another jumping off point. Um, so when you each of your cases, you've talked very clearly about the data that you have access to or the data that you're trying to work with. Um, it's always mediated essentially by government or regional um, reporting and policies. So what kind of science content have you found to be most effective in building your cases or do you think would be most effective? Um, or is it more that you're just missing the data to start with, um, because those are each different kinds of problems, um, understanding the data versus having it in the first place. Um, which of those is a bigger stumbling block or which has worked best? I would just say that there's a there's a real continuum between data, between the raw, the, the, the extreme science end where people are developing methodology and developing techniques and then applying those techniques to different situations. Um, but then that goes all the way into the, the, the governments also have scientists and they and like the UN reports and the and government reports and nonprofit reports are what what scientists think of as the gray literature. They're compiled without necessarily peer review, although some of them are peer reviewed. And there so there's there's quite a continuum on the um, certainly the audience and the the degree of detail that are in, in each one of those and i feel like they're all important we just be, need to be able to um, communicate across those different types of of report a little bit better and maybe understand the context for each one like who who was it written for how was it developed um, and uh, how is it being used yeah, I was going to say maybe a different way to phrase that question. So I will take a step back and come at this question from a different perspective. Each of you is talking about the role of the science data, but also things that you have to go to other resources to find out. So it seems like a key part of this is not only having the scientists and the legal experts. How do you build your network so that you can deal with each individual case? So Julia, for example, you pointed out that every case is different. How much of it transfers and how do you go about building a network so that you can get to the science that you need? How do, how do you figure out how to talk to people? Yeah, um, often it's about uh, getting a sense of who's acting already on that sphere, um, both in terms of civil society and as well as uh, scientists and lawyers that are already looking at it. So for example, at the, the Center for Climate Crime Analysis, we always work through, through networks. This is exactly what we do. We try to map out who are the people that are involved, who may have information. Can we gather that information, collect it, put it together into one analytical product so that we can get a better sense of what's happening um, and strengthen the evidentiary uh, basis for, for a case to tackle that problem. And through this work, we start. We realize that we start building these networks, and it, it's all sorts of people. So um, it may be from indigenous peoples that are letting us know that they're having increased pressures on their territory because they are based there, so they can see the legal lovers like going into their territory and like you know doing things that like no one else will know. Only the people that are based there will know. That gives us perhaps the hook of like, okay, we need to look here, and then that may lead to like us looking into different sources of information. Um, lawyers are very good. I think uh, this is something again where I think lawyers and scientists uh, should collaborate more on. Lawyers are very good at uh, getting information that all their actors may not want to give. <laughs> um, so one of the conversations that I've had uh, with some scientists would be that you know they they've spoken to the to the authorities because for their own scientific studies they wanted to sort of compare with like you know what are what are the companies reporting or what are the you know what are the other measurements that are available right because they want to compare what they're doing versus what somebody else may have measured on this or, or estimated for the same uh location and the answer that they get from the authorities is like oh we can't give you that information sorry but that's because you're just asking nicely you need to compel them to give you that information um so 
that is again somewhere where I think the the link between lawyers and, and scientists is very important. Scientists may help identify what information they need to be able to sort of uh, show more um, with a stronger basis that something is right or wrong or that something was not done appropriately or that there's an issue with the with the information that is being presented. But lawyers may be the ones that can twist the arm of um, actors that have that information to give it. And, and then we may need the help of the scientists again to read through that information and pick out those nuggets that are that are really important. But I think one of the problems that we see a lot is that lawyers are going at it themselves or scientists are going at it themselves when they actually should be like talking to each other constantly, not like one time to produce one study that's gonna help one case. But I, I actually think that it should be on an ongoing basis and, and at very different stages of, of a case or a, or a potential case or a campaign uh, to identify what is information you need. Okay, I can perhaps go retrieve that information, but then I'm gonna need your help to see what I need to pick up from that information. And it's a it's an iterative process. Yeah, I think I agree with everyone else here. Um, we all need to work together to access the data that we cannot access and twist arms or, you know, go to court, administrative court or something if the data that we deserve to know is not being disclosed as promised or it's not transparent. Um, there's a case going on right now in Mongolia where a group of law students and um, pro bono lawyers um, called uh, Lawyers Without Borders, they teamed up to demand accountability from the city administration um, because we already have a regulation that says, okay, buses and heavy vehicles, uh, heavy industry vehicles that use diesel, they are supposed to have exhaust filters. If they don't, they're not allowed to participate in traffic, but that's not being enforced at all. And we don't have access to the official report, the audit, or you know how this regulation is specifically being enforced and who is in violation and what they're doing about. And they had to go to administrative courts to demand that report. When they requested it, they couldn't get it. So now they had to go to court to have that have access to that information. Um, another uh, crucial um, data point, I think, or uh, information that needs to be in our hands is just, you know, the, the data and everything that we need to know, it needs to be publicly available. It needs to be communicated to the public in a very digestible and actionable format. Um, uh, in Mongolia, a lot of the times our journalists interview experts. So if we're looking for some kind of data, we don't always find it in an official report or study. We, found it, we find it from the mouths of experts in an interview. You know, and it's really hard to, you know, make it very uh, valid, especially in terms of uh, legal context, right? They're not testifying in the court. They're not under oath, but they're like, okay, you know, they're spitting out all these statistics from their own studies or work experience. And that's the closest we, <laughs> that's the closest data we have to have some insight on this issue. So, and then, you know, these, you know, these, um, dedicated experts give like really important information to journalists on the news site. And then if it stirs up the pot, you know, if it's like important and it's controversial, the government pressures those sites to take it down. So, and it's gone. And then I have to chase down those experts to learn from them, you know, and they have to give me more resources and their studies and all that. Um, I had one example of where uh, during COVID, we created this timeline of uh, international grants that a country received from World Bank, World Health Organization, IMF, and all that. And we laid it down and said, like, okay, Asian Development gave us this much money, and we promised to use it for, you know, to strengthen our healthcare system. 
where's the money? <laughs> and the Ministry of Finance, they reported on it. They showed our graphs. They took out our logo and they showed our graphs. Okay, yes, that's Trajan Development Bank gave us this much money and we, we have the receipt from our central bank and we're gonna use it for this and that. And they did a live video and we knew it was gonna happen and they took it down. <laughs> but we uh, downloaded the video, we took screenshots and we have a record of it. So censorship, is also a, a huge obstacle when it comes to data and building cases too. Yeah, one thing that strikes me about all of this is how challenging it can be in any given local situation or any particular case to figure out what the best angle is for the case. And what strikes me is that even if there is science and evidence, which I'll say from a science perspective, like science data that shows that there's an issue, it seems like it can be incredibly challenging to build a case. Um, so I, I'm, I guess maybe I'll ask the people who are more involved in, in trying to build these cases from the examples we've heard, how do you approach this? Do you need to find the legal pinning first and then look for science to support that? Or are there instances where you look at the, the science and say, wow, we need to find a way to make this case work? What, what is your thought process in putting this together? Well, I think it depends, right? There's no one right way to go. There's no like an order or like a protocol, right? So whatever we, we get hold of first. <laughs> So if we get hold of the scientific data first or some kind of health report or something, we can investigate like, okay, why is it happening? What can we do about it? And what are the, what are the regulations? Can we, is, is, is the existing standard being violated, existing protocol being violated, or is there no regulation at all? And we need a new kind of regulation or new sets of standard um, to tackle that issue. Or if we're going through some kind of legal document, or if the government says, you know, oh, we revised this regulation or law, uh, we can look at it and say, like, does it make sense? You know, um, is it is it feasible? <laughs> uh, for example, you know, the government um, <clears throat> established the air quality standard, right? The acceptable levels of pollution pollutant levels in 2007, and then they revised it in 2016. Um, but some of the pollutants, they increased the acceptable level. And we're like, okay, why are we increasing it? Is it because we want to say like, we're not able to reduce the pollution level. So we're increasing the acceptable level and say like, okay, now we're at an acceptable level and we don't have to do much, you know? While the World Health Organization is decreasing this acceptable levels, making it even more strict, and just you know, keep keep uh, uh, keep having the pollution levels uh, low and low, so that we're making progress. So we have the situation now here in Mongolia, and we're not talking about it. We're like, why are we not revising? Why are we not making all those regulations even more stricter and just changing it so that we can say like, oh, we're doing a good job or we made progress. So it has it it can be both ways. Yeah, sorry about the connection issue. Yeah, it's. Uh, I agree that it works. Um, that it works both ways. We usually look at the evidence that is available, and then we see what uh, what case we can build, and then we sort of go back to the evidence and see whether there are gaps that we need to fill for that specific um, type of claim that we that we would want to to bring. But I agree that it's is a sort of a bit of a chicken and egg uh, situation. You're trying to keep track of uh, anything that may sort of point you to the fact that there's an issue on the facts. And then it's about what it, finding, okay, what legal hook can I use to then bring this problem to, to court or to, I mean, court is also not the only uh, avenue or the most effective one necessarily. And it's also not necessarily the only one lawyers can help with. I think that's also important to, uh, to keep in mind. But um, yeah, that is one of the ways we would look at the, we would find evidence that we think, you know, it, it, this shows that there is an issue and then we would try to find the legal avenue to, um, to bring action on that, uh, on that evidence. Uh, but sometimes it could be also that you have a novel legal um, regulation or, or uh, 
something may have changed in the jurisprudence or, or, or um, a new law may have been passed. And then what you have is the legal hook. And then you're like, okay, what evidence do I need to use this? Because I see a lot of potential. So you may be going the other way uh, around it. So yeah, it can, it can go both ways. So thanks. And Sarah, then from a scientist perspective, you get a call <laughs> saying, we need data or we need to understand how this works to help build a case. What have you found in terms of making your experience and your scientific data fit in with a legal case? Um, so I honestly don't have very much experience with this at all. So I'm speculating and, and primarily the things that I've been involved in have just involved interpreting literature for the science. So I'm not going out and measuring things for, for a legal case, but I'm being more like the translator between the, the technical side and the, and the legal side. So it's more of a communications aspect really or translation and, and looking out for those things like that, that can be misinterpreted because the terminology is different or the usage of a, the same word is different on different sides. Um, so, and it's, it's very easy for me to get, to just dig into the literature and go down and, and get to the nitty gritty stuff. But then you realize that the, the judge, I suppose for Yulia, but people don't really care about that nitty gritty stuff. Like physicists and chemists might care, like what's the molecule doing? <laughs> how, how does this technique work? Um, but still, I think you have to understand it enough to be able to distill it down into clear language. And another thing, just perhaps not addressing your question directly, but in the terms of the communication aspect in general is that, which applies both to legal cases as well as to these big um, government or intergovernment reports that are trying to communicate um, environmental issues is that scientists love to focus in on the anomaly and the the outlying point, and perhaps have seen this with your students where they come in, they've got a beautiful graph with a nice linear thing and there's one point off of it and they wanna talk all about that point. <laughs> and uh, we're trained to do that because the interest, the outlier is the interesting thing, but that's not of use for the general public when you're trying to communicate, this is a problem, this is toxic. You don't wanna say, well, but maybe in this particular case over here, if you, you know, if you're underwater, it's not toxic. Or if you're, a, if you're an amphibian instead of a fish, it's less toxic. You wanna give the big picture of, of its um, toxicity with the, you know, the error bars, the uncertainty or the, um, without using that term very undefined, but, um, you want to stick with the with the big picture key messages to start with, just to help the communication process. Um, a lot of that makes sense to me as well, because there usually isn't time for a scientist to go out and collect new data for a specific case. Uh, and so it, it's true that a, you know, a role in science, we would be spending a lot of time looking in the literature and trying to uh, get that big picture that way. So yeah, it's a quite a different, a different beast than than going into your own research lab and, and generating data. Although there there has been again with Yulia's request was some questions about like if if they were to deploy people to do measurements, what would be the proper measurements to do, and how would you assure that they were the right ones in the right place at the right time? Um, and that was a question that I really I haven't answered yet for her because I. I'm not because it's really complicated actually. <laughs> you know, you can fly a drone over and sniff at, at methane coming out of a site, but then the next step is that dreaded estimation where you have to say, okay, what does that mean in terms of the overall actual measurement or actual amount of methane that's leaking from a site? Do you have to measure it every minute of every day for 10 years before you can be confident? Or what, what measurements do you take to be confident? Without then, that's without even getting into the the uncertainties or the, the errors in particular measurements, <laughs> depending on the techniques that you use. So how how do you assess that? Excellent. So we're approaching the end. So or well, not the end of the topic, of course, but the, maybe the end of the session. I would like to hear from you 
what you would recommend for others who are starting any kind of a project that's at the intersection here of science and climate change related uh, climate change related litigation. Um, what kind of advice would you would you give to people getting involved? Well, from the from the science side, I mean, I signed up for the AC AAAS um, uh, on call scientist quite a long time ago, and there haven't been very many calls. I've talked to a couple people. Um, and so, but I, I think there are scientists who are anxious to get involved and try to apply their skills to these broader um, global questions and problems. Um, but we don't really know how to start other than signing up and kind of waiting. So, um, so somehow it would be nice to, to improve that um, ease. Maybe we need some networking sessions to, or some. Um, to, to improve the ability. I mean, I'd be very happy to talk with Aza um, again about her questions and, and anybody else um, to, to help continue the conversation. So I think your point earlier about networking was really, was really helpful. And I would add that, um... Yeah, we can't do everything, right? When I mean, we don't know everything, so we have to utilize a collective knowledge and collective um, knowledge management uh, platform and really create synergy between ourselves. One thing I noticed is that, you know, for the last three, four years that I've been doing this, um, obviously I don't have the science and the legal background or even the policy, anything. <laughs> um, so I had to gather teams from all kinds of sectors, you know, atmospheric scientists, um, parliamentary researcher, public health policy researcher, or a environmental uh, sustainability lawyer, or even like a data analyst student, you know? So, and, uh, and one thing I learned is that anybody, everyone can do something. Everyone brings something to the table. It doesn't really ma matter whether you're like an auditor uh, at Fannie Mae or something, or like a high school kid in the countryside everyone can pitch in and do something. So it's really, really important to be, not be picky of who you come in contact with because everyone can contribute. And one thing that, one of the weaknesses that I've realized um, or an area that we didn't really um, work on well was marketing. Uh, marketing, branding, storytelling, because real change comes when the public is educated, when they're empowered with knowledge and resources, when they know exactly what to do as an individual or as a collective. And that doesn't happen without marketing. If we make a social media post, if it's not like visually <laughs> appealing, they're not going to pay attention. So all these marketing, branding, um, PR is really important. And, you know, working with, you know, science education people who know how to simplify this really hardcore, difficult, complex information into very act accurate, <laughs> fact checkable, uh, you know, items, and people can understand the issue and they know exactly what to do. So one thing we'll focus a lot more on in the coming years is working really closely with marketing and PR people, and even working with influencers um, to really uh, make, uh, educate people in a very attractive and fun way. Uh, otherwise, you know, we won't get their attention and we won't have the momentum uh, to come together to demand action. Yeah. So with, even if the lawyers and the scientists are doing so much important work in the background, if they don't have as much um, public support, you know, they can squish, you know, the decision makers, they can do all kinds of things and squish it. But if they do it very publicly, um, or even like even with international media coverage, local and international media coverage, with investigative journalists on the background doing fact checking, and everyone being vocal about it, especially the scientists and lawyers being very vocal about it. And then the marketing people helping them to in, speak and communicate in a very um, easy to understand and digest way. Um, I think that they, they, those would be like a dream team. Yeah, I, I agree on the, on the fact that communication is key and both sort of the PR marketing, getting the public opinion uh, on board as well as 
between uh, between disciplines. The image that always comes to mind whenever I have to speak to a scientist, or one, we also have technical people in our in our team, mostly engineers, and I always have this feeling of like we're both speaking at a B one uh, level of a language, so we have an intermediate command of the common language. So the room for misunderstanding is huge. You need to sort of like double check, triple check that what your understanding is exactly is what they meant to say and not just the way you uh, the way you heard it. I think ultimately the advice that I would that I would give is be very open, be very patient and be very curious because it's going to be back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And as you understand a bit better, you will ask better questions and the other person will also learn a little bit about your perspective and then they will come to you perhaps with information that is more relevant or they will see something and then they now are thinking about that. So then they're like, oh, wait, this could be relevant or this could be helpful. And then they bring it to your attention. So it has to be um, uh, it has to be communication uh, both ways. And um, for legal cases specifically, I would say be very clear on what is the role that the science is going to play in the case specifically that you will have in mind or that you are already launching because it's not that the scientific evidence is not going to be everything. So you need to understand what role the science is going to play in that case uh, and what is the point that the that the lawyer is trying to make. And from the legal perspective, understand what are the legal arguments that you could be putting in front of the judge or a decision maker of any sort um, that may be shaped by the science uh, and that you may have to like walk the, the audience through, you know, educating them, uh, as, as I was saying, to, for them to understand. But yeah, it, it's a... Uh, it's a double uh, double channel communication. Excellent. Well, thanks again for all of you. Uh, this has been a very lively discussion. And just to summarize, there were a surprising number of unifying themes. Um, I certainly heard that everyone involved in building these cases finds this to be a very steep learning curve because there's so many different pieces. It's not only the science and the legal side, there's also government policy mediating all of this, and each case is unique. Um, I also heard that the science can be complicated to convey because there are different metrics and reporting methods that can adapt and change. Some of it's necessary, but all of it changes the way we work with data. Um, but the other positives I see is there's networking is a key piece of that because not you, no one person can do all of these things, and so it's the network uh, that will help build that. And even though we're focusing on the role that science and climate change litigation play together, a key part of that is making sure the public is aware of this so that you can brand and market and make sure that this information is out there so that real change can happen. And there can be public pressure to make some of these kinds of changes. Um, that's fantastic. Thanks to all of you. Uh, Julia Solana, Aza Sosukhan and Sarah Green for discussing your perspectives and um, experiences here at the intersection of science and climate change related litigation. Thanks very much.